the Joe Rogan experience. So you're in this position where you have this information and you, you know that these surveillance systems are in place and they're unconstitutional and you feel this deep responsibility to let the American people know about this. What, what makes you take the leap? So this is um, covered uh, extensively in the book um, because it took a long time. I would imagine. Um, people, people, you know, yeah, right, exactly. People like to think it's like a cinematic moment um, where I find this golden document, like the Stellar Wind Report, and that's the closest thing to a smoking gun, right, that, that exists. But look, if you found that, you, you can read that later. Look at that and like imagine yourself being like, oh, I'm going to go outside on the courthouse steps and wave this thing and burn my life to the ground, burn my family to the ground. I'm never going to be work again. Uh, I'm going to jail for the rest of my life. Um, the question is, what would it take for you uh, to light a match and burn your life to the ground? Um, and for a long time, uh, too long, um, the answer was nothing, and I'm 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 ashamed of that. Uh, it took me uh, so long uh, to get over that hump because I was waiting for somebody else to do it. Uh, when I saw uh, people like Ron Wyden on this, uh, when I saw people like the court case that I showed before, where people were actively challenging these programs, right? Journalists had the scent of it. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to be in, you know, the, the YouTube comments or whatever and go, oh, I knew this was happening. No, you didn't. Well, Bill Bimini. You had he, uh, Bill Bimini. Yeah, Bill, yeah. Bill, excuse me, Bill Bimini. He initially was the one that came out and spoke about this issue. And it, so, yeah, Bill Bimini uh, is uh, part of, shall we say, the group of early NSA whistleblowers who came with Thomas Drake, uh, Bill Bimini, uh, Kirk Wiebe. I believe, in Ed Loomis. Uh, and these guys all got their doors kicked in. You know, they, they got harassed um, by the FBI. Tom Drake, uh, who was a senior executive at the NSA, this is a guy who had a lot to lose, uh, was charged under the same law I was, the Espionage Act. And these guys were doing it earlier during the Bush administration. Some of them were talking to the journalists uh, that, in, you know, maybe it's alleged. I don't want to put them on the spot. Maybe they deny it. Maybe they don't. Uh, leave that to them. Um, but... Uh, Somebody somewhere was informing this reporting, right, that got into the New York Times about the Bush-era warrantless wiretapping program. And eventually, journalists put this out there. People knew these capabilities existed. Um, but yeah, then, then there's the person in the YouTube comments who's like, oh, we knew all about this. It's nothing new. And the thing is, you can know about some programs and not know about others. You can have a suspicion. You can know with certainty that this stuff is capable or is, is possible. The capability exists. You can know that the government has done this stuff in the past. You can know they are likely to do it again. You can have all these indications. You can have um, like the Jewel versus NSA case uh, that's um, run by the EFF, which is about the AT or it's about AT and T setting up uh, secret rooms in their uh, telecommunications facilities where they basically drag uh, all the fibers for their domestic internet uh, communications and like phone communications into a room that's purpose-built for the NSA and then they bring it out. Um, but AT&T denies it's the NSA. Uh, the NSA denies that these things uh, happen or that are done at all, right? And so this is the context. Uh, you say you know and, you know, let's put it the other way. Maybe you do know, right? Maybe you're uh, an academic researcher. Uh, maybe you're a technological specialist. Uh, maybe you're just somebody who reads all the reporting and you actually know. Uh, you can't prove it, but you know this is going on. But that's the thing in a democracy. The distance between speculation and fact. The distance between what you know and what you can prove to everybody else in the country is everything in our model of government. Because what you know doesn't matter. What matters is what we all know. And the only way we can all know it is if somebody can prove it, if you can prove it. And if you don't have the evidence, you can't prove it. And of course, when we talk about the earlier stuff, right, like this, uh, a more corporatized media, they've got a thousand incentives not to get involved in this stuff. They need access to the White House. They need these officials to sit down with them uh, and give interviews, right? That's constant content that they need. That's access that they need. They need to be taken seriously. They need to be, uh, you know, uh, admitted to briefers. Uh, it is a codependent relationship. And yet, 
uh, and, rather, and so the only way to make sure people understand this broadly is if we all work together, right? Um, if we collectively can establish a corpus of evidence, right, a body of facts that is so large and so persuasive, it overcomes uh, the natural and understandable resistance of the, these more corporatized media groups. Um, it overcomes uh, the political and partisan uh, sort of loyalties that, that all of these uh, political factions in the country do, where they go, you know, it's, it's my president. Even if I don't like this stuff, even if I don't agree with this stuff, I don't want to say it exists. I want to deny it until it's proved, you know, uh, <laughs> in HD on video, you know, signing the order to do this, that, or the other. Um, because otherwise there's a chance my guy might not get reelected. And that's the only way this kind of stuff can happen. And the sad fact is... The opportunities that we have to prove this, like the, the moments in history where we do prove something, anything, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, are so few uh, and, and so rare that they almost always only come from whistleblowers. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, one of the problems that we have, uh, particularly in the, the climate movement. Did, uh, today. did you look? Ev Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you take any comfort f from knowing that Obama, when he was running for office and in his Hope and Change website, he had provisions to protect whistleblowers and provisions to <laughs> to reward people? Right. I mean, do you remember yeah, all that? Yeah. I mean, it was eventually redacted or eventually deleted it from the website. <laughs> yeah, but that, disappeared it from the yes, website. Yes, but that was a big part of his program or what he was running on was that when people were exposing unlawful activity, he was going to protect those people. Did that? Did you take right. any comfort Obama in that? Obama also campaigned. Well, Obama also uh, during his campaign said uh, he campaigned actively against the warrantless wiretapping the Bush. Administration, Because right. remember, Bush is in the scandal, the height of this, uh, in 2007. You know, the election's coming up right after. And he's going, uh, Obama's saying, uh, you know, that's not who we are. That's right. not what we do. Um, and yet, within 100 days of him becoming a president, uh, now he's sitting in that chair. Rather than extinguishing these programs, he embraces them and expands. Why them, do you think uh, that is? More entrenched. I think it's actually, uh, again, what we talked about earlier. First thing, uh, every time a new president comes into the White House, uh, they get their clearances, right? They get read into all this stuff. Uh, during the campaign, they get clearances and they get read into and stuff. But when they finally become president, right, now they're the only people who can sign what these are called the covert action findings and things like that. Um, which are basically, you know, the intelligence community wants to assassinate somebody. They want to run this illegal program here, there, or everywhere. Um, and they can't do it because they're executive agencies without that top-level executive sign-off. Uh, and so they got to open the vest, right? they got to get these guys on, on side. Um, and uh, basically every president uh, since Kennedy, um, they have been successful in uh, what they call fearing up. Uh, where as soon as they come in, uh, they lead you, read you the litany of horribles. And they go, these are all the threats uh, that we're facing. And let's be real, it is a dangerous world. Uh, it's not just all made-up BS. Uh, some of it is, right, where it's inflated. It's not that it's completely false, but they make it sound more serious than it actually is. Um, but there are real bad people out there who are trying to do real bad things. And you have just gone through a hellish election... Um, because our, our electoral politics are so diseased. Um, and, uh, and now, after you've crawled through fire, you're already thinking four years ahead. You know, how, how do I stay in this seat? And these guys are basically saying, uh, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, this is going to fall on your lap. And the implication, which I, I don't think they actually say, but every president knows, uh, is these guys can undermine you to death. Um, if you've got the IC uh, against you, right, uh, they can stonewall you. They can put out stories that are going to be problematic for you uh, every day of your presidency. Um, and it's, it's not that it's necessarily going to cast you out of the White House, but it's a problem that as a president you very much don't want. Uh, so in the most charitable interpretation of this, you've got a new guy coming in. In Obama's case, this is a pretty young guy. 
um, doesn't focus in this kind of national uh, security foreign policy stuff throughout his earlier career. He's more interested in domestic policy and always has been. That's actually one of the positive things to say about Barack Obama. Um, he's just trying to make things better at home. And now suddenly they go, look, you need to worry about this country. You need to worry about this group that you've never heard of. You need to worry about, you know, this technology. You need to do all this stuff. Uh, and the only reason we can tell you this stuff and the only thing dividing America and the abyss are these terrible, 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 terrible programs, right? Uh, that are in fact wonderful things because they keep back the darkness. And so here's, here's the, the, the real problem. Uh, every president hears that, and every president, you know, first off, they've got so many other things to do. Is They, they just kind of nod their head, and they'll go, I'll deal with this later in my administration. And this, this is one of the ironies. Uh, when I come, came forward in 2013, right, this is now Barack Obama's second term president. Uh, one of the responses that they had to the mass surveillance scandal was, yes, we think they went a little too far. This is after the initial thing where they went, nobody's listening to your phone calls, you know. Uh, just made a data. Right. Nobody, nobody can have uh, perfect privacy and also have perfect security. So we got to sort of divide a line here between <laughs> the Constitution and, you know, what the government wants to do. Um, but they said, uh, we were going to get to it. We knew these programs were problematic, but if they just gave us more time, we would have fixed them. Maybe it's true, right? Seems, seems awful convenient in hindsight that throughout the entirety of the first term. Well, it seems it. like what you would uh, say if you got caught. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, but look, uh, in, if we're being the most generous uh, that we are here, the president is briefed on real and legitimate threats. And they scare the hell out of him. I'm sure. Um, and we can, we can all imagine being there, right? Those, those of us who remember what the world was like post-9-11, fear is a powerful thing. But the guys who are doing that briefing, they're no longer scared of it uh, because they've been dealing with this for years. This is the oldest thing. They've given this briefing times before. You know, when we talk about, people talk about the deep state. Right? They, they, they talk about it like some conspiracy of lizard people. It, it, it's not that. It's something much simpler. The deep state is simply the career government. It's the people who are in the same offices who outlive and outlast presidencies. Right? They've seen Republicans. They've seen Democrats. They don't really care. Uh, and they give that same briefing again and again, and they get good at it. They know what they want. Uh, they know what this person's saying. Uh, whereas the president, they, they don't know who these people are. Uh, the, these people have been there before the president. They're going to be there after the president. Uh, and so they give this very effective, uh, very fear-inducing speech. And then they follow it up with their asks, which are really demands, um, just politely provided. Uh, and anyone in that position who is not an expert on this stuff, uh, who is not ready for this uh, uh, sort of trade-off, and who you have to understand as a career politician is entirely used to the horse trading game, right? And going, I'll deal with this later or not now, or uh, what are the, this is the cost benefit here? And the intelligence community goes, if you give us what we want, no one will ever know about it because it's classified. It's obviously the easy answer. Uh, and maybe uh, Barack Obama honestly did want to get to this later. But what we can say today is, uh, 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 for all the good that may have been done in, in that White House, uh, this is an issue where the president went through two full terms and did not fix the problem, but in fact made it worse. <laughs>